Can, can you show the slides, please? Okay. So we'll have a first lecture that will be introduced to the main speaker, really very by Professor Rui Marinho. It's about uh, a subject that's very much important on precision medicine and also how to prevent cancer. And then we'll have seven presentations, short communications of about seven minutes, about some of the work that's being developed in our university. I ask you kindly to be precise on time, because you need to do it on time. And after these seven presentations, we will have the pitch presentations for all the masters and PhD works that are being submitted for this evaluation. And so uh, without further ado, not losing time, I'm going to give the word to Professor Rimering, who is going to introduce uh, the main speaker of today. Thank you. So, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Rui Marinho. I'm gastroenterologist and hepatologist in the Medical School of Lisbon and also director of the Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatology. It is my pleasure uh, to present in the 3 a.m. in the United States, Professor Rui Ribeiro. is a Portuguese uh, biostatistician uh, working in Los Alamos National Laboratory and we'll present uh, by, by Zoom a uh, plenary conference called Hepatitis in Cancer Prevention. Uh, hepatitis C is an oncogenic virus. Uh, the researchers uh, has won the Nobel Prize in 2020. In, in my point of view, it's one of the major achievements uh, in control of a virus, in chronic virus. So, Professor Rui Ribeiro from Los Alamos. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Yes? Okay, excellent. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Professor Luis Costa and Professor Rui Tatmering for inviting me to um, talk to you about my work, Modeling HCV Dynamics, and um, uh, also some of its connections to hepatocellular cancer and perhaps even more tenuous, tenuous connections with uh, precision medicine. So HCV is a single-stranded positive RNA virus, which infects liver cells, hepatocytes, uh, and, and thus causing hepatitis. It's in the same family as other important viruses, such as yellow fever, dengue, and Zika. But these other viruses are, uh, for the most part, mosquito-borne, whereas hepatitis C only infects humans, and it's transmitted by bodily fluids, sexual transmission, blood, uh, injecting drug use, um, and so forth. It's, the WHO estimates that there's about 71 million people in the world infected with hepatitis C, so chronic carriers of this virus, and still about 1.5 million new infections every year. And this results in, uh, estimated 300,000 deaths. And for this reason, the WHO has uh, developed a global uh, strategy uh, with the objective of eliminating hepatitis C as a public health problem by 2030. And eliminating it as a public health problem means reducing in 80, by 80% 80 the incidence of, of this infection and by 65% mortality in relation to uh, the numbers in 2015. And for these reasons, many countries, including Portugal, have strategies to uh, achieve this objective of eliminating hepatitis C. And we might be able to do this because hepatitis C, as Professor Rimering just mentioned, is one um, of the most uh, incredible success stories of the development of uh, pharmaceutical interventions so-called direct acting antivirals that have um, been discovered and developed uh, in a succession. Uh, in, in today, there's about six uh, approved drugs in three different classes, protease inhibitors, polymerase inhibitors, and NS5A inhibitors. NS5A is a protein of the, of the virus um, with, with a function that's not um, completely elucidated, not is the mode of action of these drugs, but it's related to um, 
the formation or the inhibition of formation of replication complexes that flavivirus uh, organize during its replication um, uh, cycle. And uh, these drugs are extremely uh, effective. In fact, they result in about 95% of uh, cure depending on comorbidities and other cofactors for the person who is infected. And cure here is defined as sustained biological response here. And it means that the person who is treated sees the virus uh, in circulation in the blood, the, the level of virus, the amount of virus drop very quickly uh, until it goes below detection. A person stops treatment in if, if at 12 weeks after this stopping of treatment, the virus is still below detection, then we say that this person is a sustained viro virological responder. And in the 99% of, of cases, that person is cured in the sense that it eliminated the hepatitis C. But unfortunately, in spite of this great success story of medications uh, uh, to control the virus, we still don't have a vaccine. And this uh, uh, is a problem for the continued uh, incidence that I, I mentioned uh, before. And still also an issue that I've studied somewhat, but we don't have time to talk to them. What is the relation then of hepatitis C with uh, cancer? Hepatitis C is one of the main uh, causes of hepatocellular carcinoma, a primary liver cancer. And in fact, when a person is infected with HCV, a, a small minority, depending again on cofactors and the genotype of the virus, might spontaneously resolve the infection. So the immune system uh, can clear the infection without any uh, intervention. But the majority will uh, progress to chronic infection, uh, which is lifelong um, without treatment. And this leads to dysregulation of the physiology of the liver, including development of fibrosis and eventually cirrhosis. And uh, then a few, a few percent of people every year will either progress to the compensated cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma, which has um, a relatively poor pro prognostics. In fact, hepatocellular carcinoma is the seventh most incident cancer in the world but it's the second cause of cancer death after lung cancer. So it's really an important problem. And HCV, hepatitis C virus, together with hepatitis B, are uh, two of the uh, most important causes of hepatocellular carcinoma. But why is that? Well, most likely this is related to the state of inflammation and turnover of, of uh, infected cells that uh, hepatitis C causes. And how can we learn uh, about this? The answer lies in analyzing data of people under treatment. Here is some uh, picture from a study from a, a colleague of mine, where what we see is on the y-axis is the amount of virus, of hepatitis C virus in the blood of an infected person in the logarithmic scale and measured international units. And on the x-axis is the time it takes for uh, uh, the time since the start of treatment. And what you can see is that the virus decays very quickly in this kind of biphasic decline. On the right-hand side, we have the same graph, but in a different time scale, years, weeks. And this uh, very fast decline gives us a hint of how fast is the turnover um, of the virus. And uh, what I have done over uh, a long time is analyze this type of, of data using models, a simplified model of the life cycle of the virus. We have hepatocytes here, and schematic of the model is represented in this slide. We have hepatocytes. These are, are infected with virus to generate infected cells. And then infected cells will produce virus completing the cycle. And this is uh, how the virus replicates in, in a free virus is cleared from circulation at a certain rate. And in uh, infected cells are also lost uh, uh, at a certain rate. They are healed by the virus, most likely by the immune response to the virus. And we can transform this very simple uh, representation of the life cycle into equations. It is just an example of what's happening to the virus. This says that the change of virus over time 
is equal to the production of virus, P times the number of infected cells, minus the clearance of virus, C, the rate of clearance times virus. And when we start treatment, well, like I showed in the previous slide, we can think that treatment will prevent production of virus. So infected cells can no longer produce virus or produce much less virus. We can adapt our equation, say that now production of virus is uh, hindered by a certain factor, which is the effectiveness of the drug. If this drug is completely uh, uh, efficient at preventing new production, then epsilon would be one, this is zero, and then the virus would simply decay as an exponential decay. That's what that would be. But most often, these drugs are very effective, but not perfect. So maybe epsilon will be 0 0.95 or 0 0.99. And so we can solve these equations and write corresponding equations for the other players here, the infected cells, the target cells, and so forth, and then analyze the data with the solution of those equations and thus estimate parameters of, of the dynamics of the, of the virus, such as C or delta. And this is what we obtain. Here are eight uh, individuals. Um, with the, uh, the blue symbols corresponding to the measurements of uh, viral load in the blood of, the, uh, of these uh, people measured by uh, a PCR. And they have two different types of treatment here on the top row and the bottom row, but that's not really uh, important. And the line here is the fit of a model similar to the one I just showed you to the data. So it's the best fit that allows us to estimate the parameters of the model. And what the model tells us is that this first very fast phase of dec decline is related to the clearance of free virus, that's C. And the second um, um, slower decay of virus is related to the death of infected cells, so the loss of infected cells. From here, uh, knowing how fast virus is cleared, we can already calculate the production of virus. And so if we think about how much virus an infected person has before starts treatment, which is 10, about a million to 10 million um, copy variants per milliliter, we know the uh, C, so this clearance rate and the volume of distribution of the virus, we can multiply all these to uh, di discover that uh, about 1 billion and I mean Latin billions, not Anglo-Saxon billions, one billion virus are being produced and cleared from circulation every day in a chronically infected person, which, as I mentioned, can be uh, for life. So uh, this is a very fast uh, infection with many, many uh, variants being produced and cleared every, every day. And one consequence of this that we can immediately imagine and that we have also uh, studied in the past year, for instance, is that emerge, uh, drug resistance to treatments can emerge uh, very fast. And in this uh, study, we had quantified uh, how fast emergency can arise to drugs uh, for which a single mutation is enough to, to uh, develop exist resistance. Again, these are four individuals who have developed resistance within uh, a week of uh, starting treatment with a drug which is no longer uh, used. And, but this is one reason why treatment uh, is uh, typically done with two uh, or three different drugs of different classes, from protease inhibitors or polymerase inhibitors or the NSI inhibitors that I mentioned before. This prevents um, resistance from emerging because the virus then needs to mutate at more than one position. And that's obviously more difficult and less probable. But going back to uh, this decay rate, as I mentioned, the second phase of decay, slower phase, the model says is uh, related to uh, the death of infected cells. And when we estimate this parameter, we find out that the lifespan of infected cells is only about three to five days. The lifespan of the virus is much, much shorter. Clearance is very fast. So that first phase was uh, very rapid. But the uh, perhaps most important thing, especially in terms when you think about cancer, is how fast uh, infected cells are, are being lost, three to five days. You need to compare this 
with the estimated or at least what we think is the lifespan of healthy hepatocytes, which is the harder of hundreds of days. So this means that uh, hepatitis C is inducing uh, a much, much faster turnover uh, death and replacement of uh, hepatocytes than what would be normal. But one question that can arise is, um, I've been talking about what's happening in the periphery, what you can measure in the blood, but this is an infection that occurs in the liver. So what are the dynamics in the liver? And this is um, something that uh, we have also been studying. And uh, with a collaborator at Johns Hopkins University, we have this very neat um, single cell laser capture micro dissection um, uh, um, technique, uh, which we published first uh, in, to in 2013. And since Professor uh, Rimmering mentioned, uh, uh, our paper had this opinion written by Tim Sheehan and Charles Rice, who is the person he mentioned got the Nobel, one of the people that got the Nobel Prize for um, discoveries related to hepatitis C. But in this, in this, uh, in this um, uh, technique, what's done is we start from a, a liver biopsy, and then a section, a very small section of 10 by 10 cells, which are each individual cell is cut by laser uh, micro dissection, captured individually, and then we can measure in every single cell uh, what's the level of HTV RNA by PCR, or other uh, messenger RNAs that we might be interested in, such as interferon-stimulated genes, so that we can also measure the state of immune response, innate response of, of single cells. And the outcome of that is this, uh, what we call a virus scape, where we have um, the amount of HIV RNA in each individual cell, and also their relative position in this uh, small grid of cells. The size of the, of the section that we can uh, analyze is small, and, but it's mostly di detected by um, uh, how long can we use the laser without burning uh, the, the tissue. And so with this, uh, we have analyzed many patients uh, uh, to date, but uh, I'll uh, show you some results. Uh, in a study where we compared the people infected with uh, just HCV and people infected, uh, co-infected with HCV and uh, immune, human immunodeficiency virus, which is a very common uh, co-infection. And um, we, there's few people, just uh, uh, four and five. Each of them, we have multiple sections of these, at least three in each case. And uh, this is a lot of work. There's 3,200 individual hepatocytes were analyzed here. And of course, also biopsies are um, you know, invasive. Uh, and so uh, this is why the numbers are not uh, so large, but it already allows us to start looking at what's happening in, uh, in the liver. Uh, the, so the, lo the, the lo lo locus of infection. And at the top here, we have the fraction of cells infected in non-infected patients and the fraction of, of cells infected in co-infected patients. That is, in each of those grids, in each of those sections, what uh, is the number of cells infected? And what we find is that the median is 30% for uh, in mono-infection and about 40% in co-infected patients. But this is not a uh, significant difference. And the range varies between 0 and about 60%. Um, we could talk about why is it that uh, only or as much as as many as, as these cells are infected. Some people might think it's a small uh, fraction of cells infected, other people might think it's large. I can tell that we've also studied, we're also studying hepatitis B and there uh, before treatment, which is the case of these individuals are not treated, uh, typically more than 90, 95, 99% of the cells are infected. The other thing we can measure, as I mentioned, is for individual infected cells, what is the level of HCV RNA inside them? And here is the distribution. And perhaps surprisingly, we can also see that the vast majority of cells have less than 10 international units uh, of HCV RNA. And in fact, the medians for mono-infected was 2.8 international units. 
and for coin factor was 8.2 international units. Uh, and this was significantly different and we um, discussed uh, in, in this paper why that could be. But one thing we can uh, calculate now is based on what is the fraction of infected cells, how much virus uh, is there inside each infected cells with some assumptions about the export rate of RNAs into virions outside the cell. And we know the clearance, we can estimate from this data what it would be the expected viral load observed in the periphery. And when we do this, we find that our estimates here on the y-axis correlate very well uh, with the actual measured viral load in these individuals. If the estimate was perfect, then the data would fall on this dashed line where, which is measured viral load equals to estimated. So we are overestimated slightly, uh, but with just these numbers, fraction of infected cells, how, how much infected, infection in each infected cell from these very small sections, we can already have a very good estimate in, uh, indicating that what we see in the periphery is a good reflection of what's going on in the liver. But the other thing we, we have, we obtain, as I mentioned, are these virus scapes where at each XY coordinate of our uh, grid section, we know if the cell is infected or not, and also what is the level of infection here, um, in the z-axis. And uh, we have developed models similar to the ones I, I showed you before, but we'll need more detail. Now we also have some spatial component because we know where the, each cell uh, is in relation to each other, each infected cell. We also take into account what's happening uh, inside a cell, so the replication uh, inside the cell. And um, with this uh, and matching uh, this model results with the distributions that we see from in terms of the number of infected cells and the level of hepatitis C inside a cell, we can estimate what is our best estimate for the age of infected cells. And we find that's about three to five days. And this is remarkably consistent with the turnover that I had shown measured from the decay rate of virus during treatment measured in the periphery. And so there's two completely different ways to, to look at the system. One is under treatment, here there's no treatment. One is in the liver, one is in the periphery, and we can uh, get uh, uh, estimates for this turnover. They are very uh, consistent, I would say. For biological data, this is uh, very surprising. So then the question would be, you know, can we put these two things together? What happens in the liver and what we see in the periphery? And in a recent study that's still under review, we analyzed 10 uh, uh, people that were treated with these new uh, direct acting antivirals, and they were followed very closely um, for the viral kinetics, so what's happening in the periphery, with blood samples at time 0, 4, 6, 12, 18, 24, 48, 72, 96, and 168 hours. So uh, all this team, this is over the first week. And also um, uh, two ultrasound guided biopsies, one at day 0 before the start of treatment, and the second at day either 4 or 7 uh, under treatment. And uh, I may say that, again, this is kind of an invasive protocol because biopsies would not normally be necessary in clinical practice and definitely not this type of sampling. And so we have to be very grateful to the participants, the volunteers uh, that um, altruistically donate their time and, and their samples for us to be able to uh, analyze what uh, the dynamics and and try to understand better uh, this infection and what is the relationship between uh, the periphery and uh, the liver. And when we look in the blood, we see exactly what we had seen before and we have seen many, many times in hundreds of patients, which is this very uh, rapid biphasic decline, notice the time in hours. Like I said, this, uh, the model indicates that this is the clearance of free virus. This is the uh, uh, loss rate of infected cells, the death of infected cells. And in the, when we compare the reductions uh, in the periphery of plasma viral load here on the y-axis and of infected hepatocytes directly in the liver, and these are uh, the same people measured before treatment started above the line and then below 
uh, the line is after treatment, what you can see, for instance, for this person, the same symbol represents the same person, viral load was reduced by this amount to here, and the parasites was reduced by about uh, a lot. And so there is this very nice correlation between the reduction in the plasma and what you see in the, uh, uh, the liver. And this is indicating that what we see in the, in the plasma uh, in, uh, is a good uh, a reflection of what's happening in the liver. You might expect that because the virus is being produced in the liver. But what's remarkable is when you look at these individuals uh, and we see the reduction in the number uh, on the burden of, of infected hepatocytes in the liver here in black and the second phase of decline. So now not this first phase that's very quick, but the second slower phase, which the model indicated should be that of infected cells. We see that these slopes are very similar. And in fact, there is no statistical significant difference. And for the first time, we can see that that prediction of the model of that of infected cells is in fact uh, uh, what we see uh, when we look directly in the liver. This means that we could now extrapolate uh, the decay that we see in the liver in the number of infected hepatocytes until we have less than one infected hepatocyte, which should be in theory the cure. And uh, this would be how long treatment has to last. And so for each individual, we see that just from the data of the first uh, week or so, we could extrapolate how long this person would need a treatment. This could be a, 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 a way to tailor how long treatment uh, duration should happen for each person. And this is very important because these treatments tend to be very expensive. I think each pill costs about $900 and you need to take between eight uh, weeks and 12 weeks of pills, so uh, a pill every day. And uh, currently the treatment is tailored to the most difficult person to cure, so the minimum time, but we might be able to reduce time for some people uh, uh, individually, let's say, based on this data. So going back to what is the relation of all this to hepatocellular carcinoma, like I said, hepatitis C is one important agent for hepatocellular carcinoma, most likely due to the inflammation that it causes in the liver and the immune response. This immune response will be uh, responsible for uh, cell death and then the liver tends to repair. So there is this in very uh, in large increase in cellular turnover, uh, which I try to uh, show you how we quantify. It involves then also uh, metabolic dysregulation. Some uh, viral proteins have been shown to uh, affect, for instance, lipid metabolism, which will lead to physiological changes in the liver. And then uh, all of these probably also lead to epigenetic changes like DNA mutilation, histone modifications, and uh, specific microRNA inductions, which are actually maintained even after treatment uh, uh, is successful, where we reduce the inflammation, where we reduce cell turnover. We have some reversal of this metabolic dysregulation, but it seems that these epi epigenetic changes might uh, change slower. And there's still a slightly increased risk of hepatocellular carcinoma in people who have been cured of, of HCV, even if they don't have the virus. So in conclusions, you know, viral and infected cell turnover is very fast in hepatitis C infection, and this ex helps explain this propensity to develop hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, we've shown now for the first time that these peripheral viral load dynamics are a good reflection of what's actually happening in infected cells in the liver, which is a difficult to access organ. And so we now can use these individual dynamics, or we could potentially use these individual dynamics seen in the periphery to predict uh, individual uh, treatment duration. And the more general conclusion, which I didn't go much into detail, but uh, mathematical modeling of viral infections has been really a very powerful tool in many different infections to understand the life cycle, the pathogenesis in the treatment protocols uh, for, for these infections. And for discussion in terms, I would say that precision medicine is to a great extent pattern matching. This is what physicians have been doing for a, a long time. Someone comes in with uh, symptoms, complaints, and you match those to what it, you've studied or we have seen in, in clinical practice. And now we have this term for precision medicine, uh, in my view and personal opinion, because we, we can do this maybe at a much larger scale with the big databases and, and, and um, better uh, modeling statistical algorithms. 
to match uh, different uh, patterns and, and, and try to tailor the individual uh, that we see. And what I can, can say is that one new feature, a new pattern that we can think about matching is, is based on individual dynamics and is uh, modeling, uh, for example, how long to treat an individual. And so thank you very much for, for your attention. I would just like to acknowledge the people who have worked with uh, former postdocs. Uh, Shish Goyal is now at Merck. Frederick Roy is now at Edelberg, a very long-term collaboration and friend, Alan Perelson. My uh, experimental collaborator at Johns Hopkins University. And most importantly, all the altruistic participants that donate their time and samples uh, to help us further understanding of this infection. Thank you. Hi, Rui. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation. Back to basics. Uh, one question. Um, do you think we need, uh, we still need a vaccine against uh, the DAA's 100% efficacy? I, you know, in primary healthcare I, I, or public healthcare, I'd, I'd say that vaccines are always a very important uh, uh, tool. And here, one issue is that, especially there's there's a, there's a risk that people can be reinfected. And for some risk groups where behavior is very much associated, like injecting drug users, for instance, where behavior is associated with infection, it might be difficult to control completely. And this is an infection that we could eradicate from the human population, like smallpox. But for that, I think we probably need a vaccine because there is no known reservoir outside uh, the human population. Vaccines are very difficult because the virus is extremely variable. Thank you. Uh, any question from the audience? No. So, uh, thank you very much for this very nice uh, presentation. Uh, excellent, in fact. And uh, I have perhaps two questions. One is related with the the, um, the burden of uh, liver cell infection if there's any data related with uh, immunosuppression, the role of immunosuppression uh, in uh, a viral load uh, or burden of viral load. So there, there was one question. The other one is related with occurrence and recurrence of HCC and the effect of DDA treatment, if there's also any uh, data on that. Thank you very much. Okay, so the second question was it H recurrence of HCV or HCC? So hepatocellular carcinoma or the infection itself? CC. My question was HCC okay. occurrence okay. and recurrence following treatment. Okay. So um, for, for the first question, uh, there's maybe two parts of it. One is uh, one of the aspects that we are studying, but it's more difficult and the results are still quite preliminary is uh, related to innate immune responses. So we can, as I mentioned, we can also measure, our collaborators can measure uh, different interferon stimulated genes, so the mRNA, because it's by PCR, in individual cells. And one of the things that we've been very um, interested in finding out is, do we have a better innate response in infected cells or in non-infected cells? I.e., are cells which are not infected they are not infected because they have a, a vigorous innate response that prevents infection, or is it that the virus is stimulating uh, the innate, inf uh, for instance, uh, interferon stimulated genes in cells which are themselves infected? And so, we haven't really uh, been able to to answer this question exactly. And so, but we, my personal view is that. Uh, Cells are very good at defending themselves just with innate mechanisms from viral infection. And, and this is through an, an hepatitis C. Although the turnover is sufficiently fast, that's, that's maybe one reason why you don't get all the cells. Now, in terms of perhaps the second part, immunosuppression, uh, um, the, we, as I mentioned, we studied HIV co-infected patients and these people, Tend to have, they definitely progress faster, so it's a it's a, a co-infection is worse prognosis. Um, they tend to have slightly higher uh, uh, viral loads, 
But when we looked in the liver, the number of infected cells was not very different, but the amount of virus in infected cells was uh, elevated in, in, in HIV. So it's, and that's, uh, we, uh, our uh, analysis seemed to indicate that the export of virus was uh, lower in, in infected. So there is an effect of this general immunosuppression that HIV uh, does. For the second part of the question, uh, yes, there is data that indicates that even people who have been um, uh, cured in this sense of sustaining virological response have, slight, have a slightly increased um, uh, rates of, of potential development of hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, it's much, much better and much lower than in infected people. So this is a, a, a very big effect that DAAs have on redux, redux, reducing the risk of a cell carcinoma, but uh, it, it's still a little bit. And it depends on other things. So many of, this, of the patients will have other cofactors, uh, other comorbidities that are relevant, perhaps obesity, maybe, um, you know, poor diets, diabetes, um, uh, fatty liver disease, et cetera, which are also uh, contribute to hepatocellular carcinoma. And so curing the virus by itself does not completely abrogate the risk. Okay, thank you for your questions, answers, and uh, your talk in the middle of the night and uh, <laughs> have a nice sleeping right now. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you very much, and I hope everyone continues to have a great uh, day. Thank you. That was my pleasure. Now you're going to, I don't know if I have here the list of the speakers. Well, it's not this one. OK. Uh, OK, it's already your presentation. So I'm going to call the first one. Okay, so she is working in proteomics with uh, Bruno Gonzalo. So she have the first presentation. I think all of them are in cancer, but very much on precise medicine. Can I? Ah, yes, it's here. Okay, thanks so much for Professor Luis Costa's invitation, and it's my great honor to present our work here. So, hey everyone, I'm Claire Tong. I'm a postdoc from Gonzalo Bernardes' lab in Yemen. And today I want to share with you our latest project about plasma signatures analysis for disease detection. So, as you all know, the current standard of care where the blood tests are used for uh, to uh, help suspected diagnosis. So usually the patient who already has some symptoms and he came to the physician and the physician will order some blood work such as a, a panel of protein which related to a possible disease they suspected to confirm whether this patient has this, this disease or not. But what happens if the patient doesn't have any symptoms? So there are some genetic sequencing tests that are, uh, that are already developed to detect multiple cancer types. But unfortunately, these results are not very promising. And also, we all know that early detection is better than cure. Prevision is even better. So we need an approach which can allow us to detect this disease as early as possible. So let me introduce you our approach. So instead of targeting on the protein panels or the genetic panels, we are targeting the amino acid concentration signatures within the samples. So we all know from the blood sample, there are, over, there are like over a thousand of proteins in the blood samples. And all those proteins are made up of like 20 monomers, which are the amino acids. So instead of looking at the proteins level, we are targeting the amino acids signatures within the sample. But how can we do that? We are using our expertise in the bioorthogonal chemistry which we can use the specific dyes to target the particular amino acids within the samples. And after the targeted reaction happens, they will become fluorescent. And by measuring this fluorescent signal, we can figure out the concentration of these amino acids incorporated within the proteins. So, so far, we can use this approach to target cysteine, free cysteine, lysine, tryptophan, and tyrosine total 5 amino acids concentrations within the samples. So let me show you some preliminary results. So from figure one, we are using the three amino acids concentration signatures 
to uh, measure the pancreatic cancer samples we have, which is in green, and also the red dots are the healthy patient samples. So you can see by using three amino acid signatures, we can see those two uh, disease or uh, one disease with healthy patient samples, they are clustering differently in this uh, space. And also if we considering all the five amino acids, which you can see in figure two, I'm using TSNI, the, the technique to help to visualize all the five amino acid signatures in one graph. And here you can clearly see the pancreatic cancer samples are uh, uh, clustering different too and non-overlapping with the healthy patient samples. So maybe you are questioning, maybe we are just observing a general disease, a general signature of the disease against the healthy samples. And to answer this, we included more diseases here. And as you can see in figure three, we included Parkinson's disease, which is in blue, and the rheumatoid arthritis samples, which are in yellow. And you can see from this video, with the rotation of the figure three, those different colors of the, of the dots, which means different kind of disease, they are clustering in different region in this space. But again, this is only the, the measurement of three amino acids. If you consider all the five amino acids measurements we have, you can see the pancreatic cancer samples, which are in green, are different from the Parkinson's disease samples or, or the rheumatoid arthritis samples. And let's zoom in to the pancreatic samples we have. And we found by using our ACS approach, the patient, the pancreatic cancer patients who are in stage four, which has the metastatic cancers, they are clustering together and away from the patient who are in stage two and stage three, which suggests our approach can also help to differentiate different cancer stages. And we want to see how effectively our approach is. So there are two values we want to see. The first is the sensitivity. Imagine if the patient has one disease, can we use our approach to successfully detect this disease on this patient? And by this calculation, we reach like uh, around 92.4% average uh, detection sensitivity by using our approach. Another value we want to see is the positive prediction rate which means if the patient is predicted by our approach to have one disease, is that really means this patient have this disease. So here we did this calculation and we first time uh, reached around 100% for the healthy patient's predictions, which is super important in the clinics because no one wants to be predicted like you are healthy and only later on realize they actually have some disease, which will kind of delay their treatment. So I hope I could convince you that, amino, that our amino acid concentration signatures approach can be used to differentiate different diseases against healthy samples and also can be used to differentiate different cancer stages. And we believe our approach can be used for a lot of applications in the future like cancer screening and personalized medicine and so on. And to achieve that, we still have a long way to go. I will skip this detailed uh, future plans. But finally, but most importantly, I want to thank my supervisor, Professor Gonzalo, and also our collaborator, Dr. Emma from University of Cambridge, and, and also huge thanks to Professor Luis Costa's group to uh, providing all the cancer samples, especially Dr. Sandala and Patricia for their great help, and also huge thanks for, for Professor Rong Yuliku's group prof for providing all the rheumatoid arthritis samples and also Angela from uh, Bell Banku at Yemen. And thanks all the doctors and patients who contributed to this project. And also thanks all for your attention. Okay, thank you, Claire. So you are on time, so you have to, uh, two questions from okay. the audience. No questions? Is that means I'm super clear? That's so clear. <laughs> um, are you studying, just for the audience, are you studying other kinds of actually, pancreatic cancer is the perfect one because it's very hard to diagnose earlier. It's high lethality. And I think the gastroenterologist will be very happy if you could have a, a test to detect earlier and not expensive one. Not expensive one. Yeah, it's, it's cheap. And also we are uh, testing some uh, uh, prostate cancer, yeah. colorectal cancer, breast cancer samples. Okay. So you're doing 
try to do the same for other cases. Yes. yes. Okay. So no further questions? No? I think, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, Joana? Então, chamava Joana Dias, Faculdade de Medicina Veterinária. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Red Sud for the invitation. I'm representing Frederic Ars de Silva Group at Veterinary Medicine Faculty. Today, I will give you a small glimpse of our more recent work entitled Leveraging the One Health Concept for the Development of Antibody-Targeted Therapies Against Non-Hodgkin Lymphoma. Immuno-oncology has completely transformed cancer therapy. Despite this success, only a small percentage of cancer patients benefit from this type of therapies, highlighting that there are several hurdles that must be overcome. Comparative medicines offer a platform uh, with innovative uh, complex cross-species models that can be exploited uh, for the development of novel therapeutic options and agents uh, for diseases that are common to both animals and humans. Also, this approach can also surpass many of the advantages related with conventional preclinical models that often correlate with, uh, uh, that fail to correlate with clinical success. Furthermore, this is a dual benefit approach. Owing to remarkable similarities with its human counterpart, the canine lymphoma model has been proposed as a powerful framework for rapid and clinically relevant translation of novel immunotherapies. Over the last years, we have been uh, exploring rabbit-derived single-domain antibodies for different therapeutic applications. These small antibody fragments represent the variable region of the conventional antibody, and due to their many advantages, they can be used as promising targeting molecules. Under the present approach, we, we exploited these small antibody fragments in two different approaches. The first approach is in the development of ADCs, antibody drug conjugates, and the second approach in the development of immunoliposomes, while also validating canine non Hodgkin lymphoma as a clinically relevant animal model. For that purposes, we developed single domain antibodies against canine non Hodgkin lymphoma by immunizing rabbits with a pool of primary cells uh, of a biobank previously established and characterized by us. As you can see here, the final rabbit serum exhibits a high specificity against canine on Hodgkin lymphoma targets, targets, enabling the construction of a highly diverse and representative immune single domain library. This library was subject to different panels of in vitro phase display selection followed by in vivo phase display selection in a Shenograph murine model. Next, we used ELISA screening to select the best candidates based on their binding, internalization, and also expression properties. This study was also complemented with an NGS analysis um, comparing the final recovered biopanning and the initial library. This overall, this work allowed us to select C5 single domain antibody as the most promising uh, candidate. To further characterize this antibody and confirm its, its suitability as a promising uh, molecule for targeting, we conducted several flow cytometry and immunofluorescence studies. And as you can see here, C5 binded and internalized in CLBL1 cells, that is um, canine B-cell lymphoma uh, cell line. 
Moreover, we confirmed by conducting biodistribution studies on a CD1 mice that C5 presented a fast clearance from major organs, except for the liver and for the spleen. Moreover, biodistribution studies on a tumor xenograph model also confirmed that C5 single domain antibody presented a promising in vivo tumor uptake of about 1.5%. These results were also confirmed by Western blot analysis. So to develop our ADC, we selected SCN38 as our payload. This is a potent inhibitor of topoisomerase 1 that has been previously well characterized and clinically validated. So we envisioned our ADC comprising C5 and single domain antibody connected to SCN38 payload by a linker through uh, the free cysteine at position 80. That is a unique characteristic of rabic derived single domain antibodies. Therefore, C5 was successfully converted in an homogeneous targeting drug conjugate with a one per one drug antibody ratio using a previously reported linker that is ROS responsive. Next, we confirm that the resulting ADC also exhibits a strong anti-tumoral activity on our canine non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cells while also, as expected, promoted uh, topoisomerase 1 inhibition. On our second approach, we exploited C5 single domain antibody as a targeting molecule on an immunoliposome for the development of a novel dual targeted immunoliposome. For that purpose, we developed nanoparticles encapsulating panobinostat, that is an HDAC inhibitor that was previously previously validated by us as a potent payload against canine on Hodgkin's lymphoma. These nanoparticles were tar cancer targeted by two different ligands, as I mentioned, C5 single domain antibody and also folate. Folate is a, is a ligand uh, for folate receptors that are overexpressed in many cancer types and mainly on our canine non Hodgkin's lymphoma cells. So, by, by working along with the Manuela Gaspar group from the pharmacy, the faculty of pharmacy, we developed non targeted and folate targeted liposomes. Then, we conjugated our antibody to the liposome surface through the biotin, streptavidin biotin ligation method. All the liposome formulations revealed that they had a high targeting activity against our cells, but importantly, targeted liposomes presented a high internalization property compared with non-targeted liposome. Finally, we also confirmed that all the liposomes formulations encapsulating panobisnostat presented uh, exhibited anti-tumoral activity against canine non Hodgkin's lymphoma cells, while also promoted H3 histone acetylation, which is the core mechanism of action of panobinostat. Curiously, the dual targeting liposomes show the lowest ICS-50 value. So, in conclusion, this work validated a new antibody-targeted therapy platform that combines the versatility of rabbit-derived single-domains antibodies and also the canine non-Hodgkin lymphoma model for the clinical translation of cancer immunotherapies. I must acknowledge everyone um, involved in this work that are key components of its success and uh, positive progression, and of course our group leader, Frederica, and, our, and my colleagues. Thank you very much for your attention.
Um, Joana, thank you for your presentation. Uh, is there also a model for, uh, for uh, Hodgkin lymphoma? No, Hodgkin lymphoma in uh, animals, especially in dogs, are very rare. There is some reports, but uh, it's not even really confirmed, but uh, it's really, really rare. Is a non-Hodgkin lymphoma in dogs related with longevity? The, the dogs getting older and older or not? Yes, of course. As we see our animals aging, we also see a higher incidence of cancer types, namely non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Okay, thank you. Uh, now, Nuno Bernardes, Instituto Superior Técnico. So, uh, good morning, everyone. First, I would like to, to uh, acknowledge uh, Red Sud for this kind of invitation to present my work. So I will talk a little bit about tumor targeting strategies for the development of selective therapies uh, towards cancers. So just a brief overview of the work that we have been doing in our group at Technico. So we focused mainly our work in proteins that are derived from bacteria, namely a specific protein called azurin. And throughout the years, we have been looking at the effect of this protein in several models of cancer, in particular in regarding the ability of this uh, protein to induce a membrane remodeling on cancer cells and by in this way to attenuate uh, many uh, proliferative uh, signaling pathways that are associated with cancer progression. We then focused a, little, a few years ago our work in trying to make use of this protein or peptides that may be derived from this protein into a more uh, uh, tumor targeting strategies for delivery and inducing an anti-cancer effect. So we have a project ongoing regarding the expression of this uh, protein uh, in mesenchymal stromal cells, which can lead the protein directly to the tumor microenvironment. And more recently, we focused our attention in the usage of a peptide that is derived from this protein called P28 to induce tumor targeting uh, specific uh, effects by combining its, its activity with uh, nanoparticles and also extracellular vesicles. So our goal in our group is mainly to understand uh, fundamental biological processes that uh, rule these interactions so that we can try to improve them. So I will skip this, obviously, because everyone here knows the importance of cancer and how to study cancer. I will just focus my attention on uh, what drove our attention to this particular type of work, because uh, we needed to improve the toxic effects that are associated with many of the chemotherapies that are currently used. And for these, these drug delivery systems that can be more selective and efficient uh, can be used and we focused our attention in synthetic nanocarriers and more recently also in this more appealing and novel uh, type of nanoparticles, biological nanoparticles like extracellular vesicles or as you may have heard exosomes, a particular subset of these extracellular vesicles. So why use cancer targeting peptides? Uh, well, ma mainly because uh, they are small compared to full proteins and therefore are more easy and affordable to produce and are much, much more plastic in a sense that with a small uh, number of amino acid residues, we can have a lot of combinations to try to induce specific effects. And they have been proven to, to be effectively coupled to imaging agent, agents, agents sorry, and other chemotherapies and synthetic or biological therapies. So as I said, we have been working particularly with P28, which is a peptide derived from the uh, bacterial protein azurin. It has been shown that it presents tumor homing activity and increases the effectiveness 
uh, of a lot of chemotherapeutic drugs, uh, more importantly by reducing the uh, concentrations that are needed uh, to achieve the same biological effect when compared it to the drug alone. And it also has its own anti-cancer activity, mainly by interacting and stabilizing P53 in uh, many P53 wild type tumors and or preventing the um, uh, degradation of this protein, therefore inducing apoptosis. And recently, uh, uh, two papers from uh, colleagues of us in the United States have used and combined this P28 peptide with a, a FDA approved dye, which was not used in, in clinic or in tumor settings, but for diagnostic purposes for uh, other uh, medical conditions. And by combining P28 with this endocyanine green dye, it was uh, uh, made possible to uh, direct the dye towards tumor cells to assist during surgery uh, for um, uh, detecting and assisting the sur surgeons to detect uh, the tumor masses, removing them more, effic more effectively, and uh, therefore reduce a lot the tumor recurrence in, in after the, the surgeries. So we have combined P28 with uh, PLGA nanoparticles in this work in, in collaboration with Brun Sarmento from I3S, and we uh, encapsulated gefitinib in these PLGA nanoparticles, which were uh, then functionalized with P28, and uh, we tested their eff effects both in vitro and in vivo. And one of the things that was more interesting for us from the beginning of this project was that the ability of these uh, functionalized nanoparticles to interact with cancer cells which must higher than their ability to interact with a non-cancer uh, uh, non-cancer lung uh, cells and indeed when combined with free gefitinib and or with the nanoparticles encapsulating gefitinib alone we uh, observed that uh, well the the at the concentrations that the, or, or which the peptide is used in the nano formulation it does not have the ability to induce a specific anti cancer effect but but when uh, using the nanoparticles encapsulating gefitinib we could induce a uh, two-fold increase in the um, anti-cancer activity of these nanoparticles in these lung cancer cells. And in vivo, we could expand a lot the lifespan of the mice that were treated with the nanoformulation. And more importantly for us, uh, the number of metastatic foci was much reduced and the metastatic score of this um, uh, uh, metastasis was also uh, lower when compared to the uh, nanoparticles encapsulating gefitinib alone. So we took a look at the full sequence of the protein afterwards and we developed a new peptide uh, coming from this protein and uh, it has a, a little bit of the same abilities as, uh, as the P28 peptide uh, but the importance for us was that uh, it has uh, uh, it is a new sequence derived from the scaffold of the full protein sequence and in this case we could redesign it by employing uh, a number of algorithms that are uh, publicly available but redesigning it in, uh, with, the, uh, with the aim of improving its anti-cancer score. And indeed, what was very important for us was that we could uh, create a peptide that has uh, the ability to decrease the viability of cancer cells while not affecting mainly non-cancer cells. And we could see that it is probably uh, related to the ability that this peptide has to target specifically the membrane of cancer cells and non, uh, when compared to non-cancer cells and in, indeed induce a profound membrane remodeling by decreasing this GP score, which is a measure of the, uh, of the membrane order of this uh, type of cancer cells, which for drug-resistant tumors is very important and related to the, their ability to resist to um, many anti-cancer drugs. So recently, we also took a look at the ability of uh, using this peptide to functionalize uh, uh, extracellular vesicles, 
obviously uh, we we did this by first isolating the vesicles and then functionalizing with a peptide that is a fusion between p28 and a peptide that recognizes a specific protein of these extracellular vesicles this is a much different process than uh, polymeric nanoparticles because it requires a lot of cell engineering and expansion prior to the functionalization of these uh, uh, extracellular vesicles, but we could also uh, observe that the P28 functionalized uh, extracellular vesicles have uh, about 1.4 to 2.4 for uh, fold increase in the uptake by uh, breast cancer cells in this case. So just a glimpse of the uh, research that we are doing now, just to finalize, we are trying to understand what drives the uh, particular interaction of this peptide towards cancer cells when compared to non-cancer cells. Uh, we believe that it must have something to do with the aberrant glycosylation, glycosylation that occurs in the um, membranes of this, um, on the proteins that are in the membranes of cancer cells. And we are also looking at the ability of this peptide to act as a fusogenic peptide to promote the functional transfer of uh, biological materials that come from these nanoparticle of or extracellular vesicles uh, into more relevant intracellular concentrations that can drive a uh, therapeutic effect. So just to acknowledge all the people that have been involved in this work and also FCT and Fulbright Portugal for the support of my research. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations for your work. Uh, any question from the audience? Uh, well, we, uh, our group, not, uh, we haven't, but one of those works that I showed that it has been recently published is towards glioblastoma, and it has been used in, in f combination with the endocyanin green as a, um, a a diagnostic tool. So I do believe that it does cross the BBB and can be used to, to um, brain cancers. Sure. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, models. Uh, the thing that we know for sure is that it looks like when uh, Azrin or P28 peptide uh, can, or at four proteins can bind to one P53. It has been described to, to at least bioinformatically to be able to uh, bind to different uh, domains of the P53 protein. Experimentally, the most consensual um, uh, effect that has been demonstrated so far is that it has the ability to block the interaction of COP1, which is one uh, ubiquitinase that will mark P53 for degradation and therefore increase the half time of P53 in, cancers, in cancer cells and then uh, to be able to induce apoptosis. But the direct interaction so far, I think, is, has been shown only with bioinformatic models and not experimentally. Okay, I think we should have to move on. Okay, thank you. I please try to respect the seven minutes. If not, we don't have time for the pitch presentations. Now it's Anna Corina Peixoto from IST. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, today I will present a part of my PhD work entitled The Identification of Biomarkers Predictive of Metastasis Development in Early Stage Colorectal Cancer Using Network-Based Regularization. So colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer worldwide and the second most deadly one. And it's, uh, it's uh, characterized by high genomic instability and also a survival rate that is highly correlated with the stage that the patient is on upon the diagnosis, being more advanced stage or stage four already metastatic related with worse survival rates. So early detection is determinant to reduce mortality, prevent metastasis, and to improve the prognosis and quality of life of these patients. 
During the past years, there was a development on novel sequencing techniques, and RNA-seq allow us to have more molecular information about the patients and using computational approaches to better classify and treat, treat them, leading to a more precise medicine. However, using this type of data has a problem, which is the high dimensionality curse. So in order to handle this, feature selection via model regularization has been used in the con context of precision oncology. So our goal was to identify a set of biomarkers that may predict the risk of metastasis in early stage CRC patients. And for that, we apply and test different classification methods and feature selection procedures based on the genes network. So the data set used was from Hospital Santa Maria, and we had two groups of interest. The early stage patient, or stage two and three, that do not metastasize, and early stage patients that metastasize. And the method used was classification, which is a supervised learning method meaning that the model learns from a set of predefined samples with given class labels, and with the knowledge inferred from this, it will classify unknown samples accordingly. And here we use these following supervised learning approaches, the decision trees, random forests, support vector machines, and logistic regression. And to apply those to RNA-seq data, we need to either use feature selection, where we select important features prior to the prediction or regularization that corresponds to other penalty to the model. So it corresponds to other constraints. And so to better understand this, we apply regularization to logistic regression that is widely used for classification problems, where uh, the logistic regression model will estimate the probability of belonging to a given class by this equation, where x's are the um, the, the genes, the variables, and betas, the regression coefficients. And so, to, to optimize these parameters, we need to maximize this function. And just to have an idea, just to, to understand that when we want to analyze RNA-seq data, since the number of features is much larger than the number of samples, we need here to add this penalty term, which is a constraint to the model, what we call regularization. And in my work, we used two types of regularizers. The first one was elastic net, that is the state of art. And uh, it has two different penalties, the lasso that will lead coefficients to zero, so it leads betas to zero, and so it performs feature selection and reach that penalize coefficients and enforce them to be small. Then we also use iTwinner, which is the method that we propose that we try to promote the selection of genes with different correlation patterns between metastatic and non-metastatic. So imagine that we have two matrices of correlation. Here, colors represent the correlation. So if gene one uh, here, we see that have different correlation patterns that the angle between those vectors will be higher. And regarding gene four that has the same correlation patterns, we will lower, uh, smaller the angle. So since we want to penalize more, lower angles, we need to do the inverse, and this will be applied to this penalty function. So here is the pipeline of the work. We applied three classification approaches to, to separate these two groups, the primary that metastasize versus those that do not. The first approach, we use feature selection where we, we apply these differential expressed genes, so we only use, this, only use this small subset containing DEGS. The second approach was regularized logistic regression, where we used the two regularizations. And the third approach, we applied the classifiers to um, the genes that were selected by the regularization instead of DEGS. And so regarding the results obtained for the first approach, we apply the five classifiers to the top uh, differential expressed genes found, and the best accuracy was obtained for random forest, as we can see here. Regarding the second approach, uh, iTwinner had the best accuracy and select more or less the same number of genes, because this was applied to the full data set. And as we can see here in the last column, regarding common genes, we, um, we did this 100 times, and we went to see how many genes were selected in common between these uh, runs? And iTwinner selected more genes in common. So here is just the table of the top genes selected by the regularizers. And we select the top 50 genes and apply 
the five classifiers, and we see that genes preselected by regularization improved the classifier's performance, and iTwinner actually had the best accuracy result followed by random forest. So to conclude, we saw that genes selected by preselected by regularization improved the classifier's performance in co when comparing to using DEGS, and also that iTwinner led to the most accurate results and selected the most stable and robust gene sets. These biomarkers found can be further studied from a biological and clinical point of view. So in sum, we show that our method, iTwinner, is a promising strategy in the classification of CRC patients based on RNA-seq data and for the disclosure of biomarkers of CRC metastasis. So I'd like to thank my supervisors and co-workers from INESC, Hospital Santa Maria, and IMEM. Thank you. One question from the audience. No. One clinical comment. It's very important, your, uh, your subject, your work, because in the next 10 years, uh, 100,000 Portuguese will get uh, colon cancer. So it's very important to, to work on this topic. Thank, Thank you. you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. From, uh, oh, someone is representing her from Faculdade de Farmacia. Your name is? Rita, okay. Good morning, everyone. So I'm here today representing Professor Elena Florindo. Uh, I'm a postdoc on our, on our group. So today I will present to you the work that we have working on the past couple years on the immune checkpoint blockade by novel small molecule inhibitors and how this small molecule can restore T cell function. So there is no question regarding the um, improved clinical outcomes using cancer immunotherapy, in specific the immune checkpoint blockers. There is several, there is several monoclonal antibodies targeting these immunomodulatory pathways. One in specific that is PD1 and PDL1. So regarding the blockage uh, of this immunomodulatory pathway, we have different approved monoclonal antibodies targeting either PD-1 or PDL one And in fact, they can activate T cells and enforce tumor recognition. Although these uh, antibody therapies are demonstrating um, an impressive uh, activity, they are ever uh, however, they have uh, still a number of disadvantages and uh, there is space for improvement due to their low response rate or required uh, resistance or even the immune-related severe side effects. Why not uh, to target so uh, why not to target this pathway using small molecules? It's better this way? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> So why not to target this uh, immunomodulatory pathway using small molecules? And using small molecules, the added value of targeting this pathway using small molecules would be um, like the greater diffusion within uh, the tumor microenvironment, their easier access to intracellular targets, or their possible uh, oral bioavailability. However, there is no PD-1, PD-L1 small molecules that are approved so far. So the aim of this project, this was a multidisciplinary project where aimed for the identification of small molecules that could target PD-1, PD-L1. This started with uh, an in silico studies with a virtual screening campaign to select the most um, possible uh, PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors, then we needed to validate uh, the compounds that were screened in silico, and then test, uh, they were tested using ex vivo and in vivo studies. So as I said, this uh, project started with a virtual screening campaign, so basically uh, we have collected a um, library of uh, 900,000 compounds, and these were screened 
on the protein, um, protein crystal, crystal structure. And basically what we got is a correlation between the affinity of the compounds uh, to, the, to the receptor with a score. So we, s we started with um, these 900,000 compounds. We select compounds with a low molecular weight as we are looking for small molecules. We used um, a molecular docking software and we only select molecules with higher scores. And we proceed with a visual inspection in order to understand the interactions, uh, the compounds with the best interaction with the target. And we went up with 96 hits. So then we needed to ensure that these 96 molecules were effective uh, through binder, through inhibitors of the, of the pathway. And this was the scaffolds identified uh, from our virtual screening campaign. And although 96 molecules is still a huge number to be tested um, on in vivo or even ex vivo. So we performed a high throughput um, assay. It's uh, like an ELISA where uh, it's not, uh, so we, you have the inhibitor, the small molecules, and if it's um, inhibiting, you have a down regulation on the signal, and among the 96 molecules, 16 were true uh, PD-1, PD-L1 uh, inhibitors. And we went up with 16 molecules that could in fact inhibit the interaction. As we are looking for modulators, we assess the effect of these molecules on different cell lines since we are not uh, looking for cytotoxic effect. And uh, we uh, went up with um, minus two molecules. And for cellular assays, we tested uh, in the end five small molecules. And all were able to um, interfere to interfere on PD1 PDL1 pathway, uh, but one in specifically were consistently having good results, and so was this molecule that was further selected for ex vivo and in vivo. So regarding the um, ex vivo uh, modulation, so we could affect the PD1 PDL1 interaction, but could this uh, result in T cell activation? So based for that, we establish a co-culture experiment using um, patient-derived samples, both uh, PBMCs and tumor cells, and they were co-culture. And we assess both PD-1, PD-L1 uh, inhibition and T cell activation. We were able to see, and we compared with a monoclonal antibody, that our small molecule could reduce the PDL1 levels uh, in similar way to the monoclonal antibody. And if you go to look uh, into markers of uh, T cell activation, we also can see that our small molecule could activate T cells in the same extent and sometimes higher than monoclonal antibody. We also performed um, 3D ex vivo experiments, so using the same patient samples, but this time we uh, prepared some spheroids to understand if we can promote higher T cell infiltration into this, uh, into this uh, tumor. And what is possible to see is that the spheroids that were treated with the uh, small molecule inhibitor could present a higher CD8 T cell infiltration into these tumor spheroids. CD8 T cells are here expressed in green. Finally, and to understand if these uh, small molecules have an effect uh, in vivo, we use the humanized uh, model where express the human PD1 and MC38 uh, uh, colorectal cancer model expressing human PDL1. And so, we treat uh, the mice both uh, in two different groups, uh, one treated with a monoclonal antibody and other with our small molecule inhibitor. The schedule was, uh, was different, so for the monoclonal antibody we give it three times per week, and uh, for the small molecule we gave it uh, every, day, every single day for um, uh, 10 days. And on 
on day 30, we characterize uh, for the animals that uh, present a tumor, we characterize the tumor microenvironment, uh, and also the, um, the splenocytes of these mice. Regarding uh, the control uh, of the tumor growth, we could observe that our small molecule could uh, strong, strongly control the tumor growth as compared to the monoclonal antibody. Regarding the tumor microenvironment characterization, and it got our intention, attention, is that the animals that were treated with a small molecule inhibitor were able to promote um, higher infiltration of cytotoxic um, CD8 T cells into the tumor microenvironment when compared to the uh, monoclonal antibody. And also, we could observe that uh, less um, uh, T regulatory cells on this tumor microenvironment. And also, our um, small molecule could inhibit, in the same extent, um, the PDL1 uh, levels on this tumor microenvironment. In the end, so we were able to identify um, small molecules that can, modu in fact, modulate this, this pathway. And we have demonstrated by using ex vivo and both in vivo studies. And maybe small molecules can be an alternative to, uh, or uh, can have an added value to target these immuno, uh, immune checkpoint um, pathways. This was a multidisciplinary project, so we have uh, a lot uh, of uh, institutions involved on, on this project. And thank you for your attention. Right out of time, just one question. Yes, one. The, the protein, right? Right. But do you give the protein some sort of degrees of freedom to move? Because you know that the crystalline structure is how you crystallize the protein. Doesn't necessarily correlate how it exists. So my, my question is, can you be biasing your results in here like uh, to a non-ideal uh, inhibitor of the so this, I, for the screening, we use this technique that is molecular docking, and it can be flexible. So yeah. you can give freedom to the residues of the protein exactly. to mimetize the, how it behaves. So uh, the screening was performed on the binding site, having freedom to these amino acids, but also we can have molecular dynamics that give you uh, also the dynamic of the, the protein itself. Okay. Yeah, we consider that. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We have had very inspiring talks for, from young people. And now we are going to start the pitch presentations. So uh, I'm going, we need to be strict. So you have really two minutes. You need to manage. And afterwards, you will have the opportunity at lunchtime to answer to other questions that people may, may tell you. So I'm going to present, the, to give the name of the presenter and indicating the name of the following presenter to be prepared so that we are efficient, okay? So first, we'll have five master theses. The first one is from Andre Santos from the Faculty of Medicine. And after Andre, we'll have João Fontella also from the medical school, okay? So, um, Jean Fonzella, please be ready. Okay? Yeah, it's good. Okay. So, hello everyone. My name is André. I come from Bruno Silva Santos Lab, and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about how regulatory T cells interact with interferon gamma producing gamma delta T cells within the tumor microenvironment. So, gamma delta T cells are a special subtype of uh, T lymphocytes that are able to display potent anti tumor and also pro tumoral functions uh, carried out by the interferon gamma producers and their counterparts, the IL-17 producers. To know how, the, how are they being regulated within the TME, we use this mouse model where we injected the breast cancer cell line, uh, and that allows us to deplete the mouse of T-Rex by, uh, uh, by doing a diphtheria toxin injection. 
uh, overall, this result resulted on uh, diminish diminished tumor, tumor growth, and at a cellular level, we can see that um, the interfering gamma positive gamma LD cells are accumulating where there, there's no uh, overall effect over the, their counterparts, the protumoral ones. This resulted in, in, the, in an increase in the interferon gamma to IL-17 uh, producing uh, um, uh, gamma delta T cells ratio, and in an increase of a, the special uh, gamma delta subsite, uh, subtype, the V gamma 1 positive gamma delta T cells. Um, then we wanted to, to, to assess how is this accumulation uh, going on, what's, what's uh, provoking, uh, what's uh, um, responsible for this accumulation. And uh, we, we, we saw that the increased proliferation uh, in situ of these uh, interfering gamma producing gamma delta T cells might be the, the responsible mechanism for this. So having this in mind, we wanted to know how are Tregs uh, in the TME uh, suppressing the proliferation of interfering gamma positive gamma delta T cells. So we used uh, qPCR to screen for known suppressive molecules and their receptors. And uh, as candidates, we have the IL-10, the IL-13, and also the IL-2 receptor alpha, which might be playing a role by the exaggerated consumption of IL-2 uh, by Tregs, which may be uh, inducing a suppression of proliferation uh, by the starvation of IL-2 in the gamma delta T cells. Uh, after this, we... Uh, we established the, uh, a co-culture system when, where we demonstrated the, the suppression by T-Rex cells, uh, and we uh, were able to rescue the, the suppression by the addition of IL-2. Uh, I will jump the take-home message and thank my lab, and especially my supervisor, and my uh, Sofia Mesrad, and my, my group leader, Bruno Silva Sanch. Thank you, everyone. So, we are now having João Fontella of the medical school, and I ask Rafaela Cavadas from the pharmacy school to be ready for the next presentation. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. So, my work is about histone deacetylase inhibitors as therapeutic candidates against IL-7 responsive acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL, is the most frequent childhood malignancy with nearly 60% of patients being diagnosed before the age of 20. And although chemotherapy is highly effective treating these patients, uh, the fact that there are severe side effects fuel the need to find better therapeutic alternatives for uh, these patients. So, uh, sorry. Uh, IL-7 signaling can provide search targets, as the cytokine, which is extremely important for the development of normal lymphoid cells, has also been shown to promote viability and proliferation of leukemic cells both in vivo and in vitro. So in our lab, we performed a functional chemical screen against IL-7-dependent um, uh, IL cell lines, and we found that histone deacetylase inhibitors, or HDEC inhibitors, were able to reduce the, the cell's viability in an IL-7-dependent fashion which we later confirmed, both in uh, primary patient samples and in patient-derived xenografts, as you can see. We then found two mechanisms by which HDEC inhibitors affect these cells. Uh, the first mechanism is through the downregulation of the IL-7 receptor at the surface, which you can see over there, through the uh, increase in acetylation and consequent uh, inhibitory phosphorylation of FOXO1, which is a transcription factor that is extremely important for the expression of this receptor. The second mechanism is through the downregulation of IL-7-associated signaling pathways that promote viability and proliferation, such as the PI3K and the KTM TOR pathway, which, as you can see there, has a lower phosphorylation level in its downstream signaling elements, S6 kinase and S6. So overall, our work has, um, has shown that HDEC inhibitors can be used to treat uh, IL-7-responsive uh, uh, ALL samples uh, in patients in order to further improve the therapy for these patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, João. Very efficient management of time. So now I invite uh, uh, Rafaela Cavadas. And uh, also I would like uh, to ask to be prepared uh, Sara Gama from the medical school. Thank you. So good Good morning, everyone. I'm a master's student at Faculty of Pharmacy, and my master's thesis was about new stimuli responsive diazoborines supervised by <coughs> Professor Peter Rush. We all know that cancer is a global health problem. However, chemotherapy still relies on cytotoxic drugs that usually don't display enough selectivity between healthy and cancer cells. So researchers are interested in finding new approaches to increase selectivity and achieve tumor target therapies. 
so with this in mind, this work aims to develop a new approach to obtain to develop sorry to develop the um that can function as ROS responsive uh, linkers to target a high level of reactive oxygen species in cancer cells. We envision that in the presence of ROS, these diazoborines will oxidize and through an intermolecular reaction, we'll obtain that compound. So we first confirmed that we could obtain the diazoborines using our approach. Um, and then once we isolated them, we confirmed that um, in the presence of hydrogen peroxide, we could obtain the desired compound. So this result suggests that these diazoborines can in fact respond to uh, reactive oxygen species, which show potential to function as ROS responsive linkers that can be useful for applications like bioconjugation and payload release. So future studies include stability studies of these diazoborines, and we are already working on a synthesis of self-evolutive linkers, and once we finish that, we'll study their oxidation and payload release. I would like to acknowledge Professor Pedagoge for the guidance and all the other members of the Goys Lab Group. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. We are now having Sara Gama from the Medical School and I invite to come Maria Catarina Carreira from IST. So, hello everyone. I'm going to present my project, which is the role of FOXA9 in IL-7 receptor-mediated B-cell leukemogenesis. And B-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia is an aggressive hematological malignancy that affects the B-cell precursors. And in BLL, IL-7 receptor is an important oncogene. So because of this, our lab developed a conditional knock-in MOS model of the mutant IL-7 receptor that drives BLL, and we can study this disease. Uh, the gene that I'm going to talk about today is OXA9, is a transcription factor, and I want you to pay attention that it is an oncogene in multiple leukemia subtypes and is highly expressed. However, to our surprise, when we did a transcriptomic analysis in our MOS model, we discovered that OXA9 was downregulated in preleukemic and leukemic samples when compared with normal B cell precursors. Accordingly, it was also downregulated in multiple human BLL subtypes. And our past results showed that by overexpressing oxanine in our leukemic cells, they don't like it because this leads to decreased proliferation of the leukemic cells, decreased viability, and increased those survival. So, may oxa be a tumor suppressor in our IL-7 receptor-mediated BLL? And we believe so. And our results showed that by performing a Western blot analysis on, oh, sorry, <laughs> On the cells that were overexpressing oxidine, we saw that this decreases the activation of the IL-7 receptor downstream singly, as we can see in the lower levels of phospho AKT and phospho S6. Uh, we also tried, we also investigated the epigenetic mechanism by which oxidine may be silenced in our leukemias, and we discovered that by using a stone deacetylase inhibitor, we, this leads to upregulation of oxidine transcription levels dose dependently. Now ongoing, we are trying to knock down OXA9, and we expect that if we knock down a tumor suppressor, we will have an acceleration of the leukemia onset. Oi, no, sorry. <laughs> in conclusion, in mutant iron cell receptor BLL MOS model, we discovered that OXA9 overexpression negatively regulates the oncogenic PI3K AKT pathway, and OXA9 is upregulated by stone deacetylation inhibition. So these results, we think, that are compatible with OXA9 being a tumor suppressor in BLL. Thank you so much. So, so we are now having the last master presentation uh, from Maria Catarina Carreira, and uh, I'm inviting Patricia Amaral from the medical school to be prepared for the first PhD presentation. Hi everyone, I'm Maria Catarina Carrera and today I'm going to talk to you about mesenchymal stromal cells and how different culture conditions can impair their function. Mesenchymal stromal cells are one of the cell types that has more potential to be used as a, a cell therapy. It can be used for several diseases and there are already 10 approved MSC uh, therapies worldwide. However, to use these cells therapeutically, we need to expand them ex vivo. And up in expansion, these cells can achieve different characteristics. One of the conditions that is not standardized yet is which culture media should be used. Fetal bovine serum is the one that, it, that was used traditionally, but it is from animal origin. And when we want to use these cells to treat humans, it is important to have xeno-free culture systems. 
So, as an alternative, we could use human platelet lysate, HPL. But there are some uncertainty about its ability to maintain MSC's functionality. So the research question that I had was, can this, the use of HPL alter the function of MSCs? In particular, their ability to support the expansion of hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. And let me tell you that, yes, it could affect very much. When I used HPL as a supplement for the culture medium, MSCs had higher proliferation capacity, which is great because I can have more cells in less time. However, these cells also presented a diminished capacity to support the expansion of hematopoietic stem and progenital cells. When I used MSCs expanded in HPL as a, a support system to expand hematopoietic cells, I obtained half of the cells than when I used MSCs expanded with FPS. These MSCs with different characteristics would then be used in patients, so it is, it is expectable that the results of the trials would be different. So it is very important to be aware of the different characteristics and different functions of cells when we are expanding them to develop MSCs-based therapies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, my mistake, this is still the last master presentation from uh, Patric Patricia Amaral from the medical school, and only afterwards we'll start uh, with uh, Carolina Jardim that I invite uh, uh, to be here from the medical school for the other presentation. Okay, so good morning, everyone. TAL is an, TALL is an aggressive childhood malignancy with 20% of the patients not responding to current chemotherapy protocols or relapsing. It surges us to find new therapies. The PI3K pathway has been implicated in TALL, with our lab and others showing that the phosphorylation of its antagonist, P10, by the case in kinase 2, leads to sustained signaling. CK2 has also, uh, also phosphorylates members of the circadian molecular clock. The CMC regulates homeostasis to 20, through 24-hour oscillations, and its disruption has been implicated in cancer. So the aim of my project is to characterize the crosstalk between PI3K and the CMC, and to devise targeted chronotherapeutic protocols to better eliminate TALL. So first, we observe that TALL cells display circadian rhythmicity and confirm we were looking at circadian oscillations by using a CMC modulator that changed the, the um, oscillation profile. Then we also observe that by inhibiting both CK2 and PI3K, we were able to significantly impact CMC as we decrease both period and amplitude. Next, we observe that the major key players of the PI3K AKT pathway also oscillate in a circadian fashion, as can be seen by the curves for the total and phosphoproteins. With these results, we developed the targeted chronotherapies for 0, 12, and random hours. Our preliminary results show that inhibiting PI3K in a circadian fashion uh, at different time points differently impacts both viability and proliferation, with the time point 0 being the best schedule for treatment. To better understand these mechanisms, these mechanisms, we still need to uh, fully characterize the remaining cell lines, but so far we can uh, conclude that TLL cells oscillate in a circadian fashion and that these oscillations extend to the PI3K AKT pathway. And by inhibiting this pathway, we affect the CMC as well. Finally, and most importantly, we have evidence that targeting PI3K AKT in a circadian fashion might be viable for treating uh, TLL patients. Thank you. Apologies, but I think we need first Van der Marks from the pharmacy school. It's because of the order of the presentation, so I'm sorry for the. So it's Van der Marks from the pharmacy school, and from now onwards, we'll have the PhD uh, presentations for the award. Uh, good morning, everyone. Cancer is a leading cause of mortality and morbidity worldwide. Cancer in the gastrointestinal system plays an, an important role in these estimates where colorectal and liver cancer are among the most incident and mortal. In parallel, of the prevalence of obesity is rising and it can be a risk factor for cancer development as obesity modulates important oncogenic signaling pathways that lead to cellular outcomes benefiting tumor development, progression, metastasization, and resistance to therapy. 
This way, our goals were to explore the obesity-associated metabolites in signaling pathways, to identify patients at risk for liver cancer development, predict response to chemoradiotherapy, and identify novel uh, therapeutic strategies against colorectal cancer stem cells. So our results show that leptin could diagnose uh, sorry, could diagnose non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and that uh, diponectin could uh, distinguish between NAFL and NASH. And IGF-1 could identify the presence of advanced liver fibrosis. Moreover, by exploring the, the leptin uh, signaling pathway, we observed that STAT3 activation and expression of stemless genes could help identify rectal cancer patients that would not respond to chemoradiotherapy. At last, we identified a novel curcumin analog that inhibited colorectal cancer stem cells by the tool targeting of the STAT3 and nf kappa b pathways that led to stemless modulation and induction of apoptosis in, this, in the cancer cells. This way, our, overall, our work showed that obesity-associated metabolites and singling pathways can be used as valuable targets in cancer diagnosis and therapy. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we'll have, in fact, Carolina Jardim from the medical school, and I'm ask uh, Joana Godinho Pereira from the pharmacy school to be ready. So hi, my name is Carolina Jardim, I'm a PhD student, and I hope to convince you that macrophages can be our allies against cancer. So if you look inside the tumor microenvironment, we observe that around 50% of the immune infiltrates are macrophages and monocytes. Macrophages are very plastic, so the, ob the goal of my PhD is to try to convert pro-tumoral macrophages into anti-tumoral macrophages, taking advantage of the myeloid cell treatment, and then dissect the functional players behind this anti-tumoral uh, phenotype. In an in vivo mouse model of breast cancer, if we treat mice with this myeloid cell treatment, we observe a total regression of tumor growth, increased survival, and a long-term memory response. But more importantly, you observe at early time points, this is dependent on macrophages. So to study the role of macrophages and their uh, diversity uh, in terms of, function, uh, of functions, we perform single-cell RNA-seq. In the macrophages, we observe, in fact, several subtypes associated with different phenotypes, but we focus our attention in this cluster one that is increased upon treatment. So this cluster, the macrophages in, the, in this cluster one, in fact, has, um, <laughs> Has have, a, have as a top upregulated gene this 6CL9 that is important to mediate the anti-tumoral immune response through the recruiting of the T cells. They also uh, have an, an overexpression of genes associated with antigen presentation and phagocytosis. And in fact, if we extract macrophages from treated tumors, they are able to interact with tumor cells and lead uh, to their killing. Uh, and moreover, we have uh, tons of other pathways that are associated with these anti-tumoral function, namely ROS and NOS cytotoxicity. And the overall take-home measure is that, in fact, taking advantage of macrophages plasticity in vivo can be of great importance to design the new strategies for cancer immunotherapy. I would like to th thank in particular to my team that helped me to develop my work and all of you too for listening. We'll now have uh, uh, Joana Godinho Pereira from the Pharmacy School, and I ask to be ready, Carolina Peixoto. Ah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, good morning. I'm here to talk about breast cancer brain metastasis. So, in uh, Europe alone, uh, every two minutes there is a diagnosis of breast cancer. That means that since uh, when this talk is over, there will be a woman, a woman diagnosed with it, and every six minutes there is a breast cancer-related death. The majority of the deaths tends to associate with the metastatic stage, and therefore uh, 15 to 25 percent of the patients develop brain metastasis. 
that once they are established, uh, treatment becomes challenging, leaving the patient with um, <coughs> sorry, leaving the, the, the patient with an extremely poor uh, prognosis. So with this, uh, my work tends to uh, tackle three main areas, which is breast cancer, brain metastasis detection, prevention, and treatment. So regarding the detection, we were able to identify microRNAs and extracellular vesicles as both early and late circulant biomarkers of breast cancer brain metastasis. We were also able to identify the molecular targets involved in the interaction between breast cancer cells and the blood-brain barrier BBB uh, interplay. Uh, further on, regarding the prevention, we started with the screen of uh, potential drugs and we identify manosatin hydrochloride as the most promising one. We then encapsulated it in order to specifically uh, target delivery to the BBB. And uh, we were able to prevent BBB disruption and breast cancer cell death both in vitro and particularly in vivo. Nowadays, we are trying to develop uh, and tackle breast uh, brain metastases that are already established in the brain parenchyma. And so we are trying to develop a new therapeutic uh, target for, for uh, brogatem. So uh, with this work, we tend to um, and hope that there is a new hope for breast cancer brain metastases. Thank you all, funding and my group. Thank you. I'm now asking Carolina Peixoto from IST to present, and I ask Rui Oliveira Silva also to be ready for presenting. So, colorectal cancer is the third most common cancer worldwide and the second most deadly one. Besides being a genetically heterogeneous disease that poses great challenge for both diagnosis and cancer therapy, the survival rate is related with the stage that the patient is on, being a metastatic stage related with worse survival. So our goal was to identify a set of biomarkers that may predict the risk of metastasis, applying and testing different classification methods. So we used patients from Hospital Santa Maria and we applied three different approaches to, character, to differentiate patients that metastasize versus those that do not. And the first approach was uh, to apply these five classifiers to a small data set containing only, only genes differentially expressed between these two groups. The second approach was to use regularized logistic regression, applying two different methods, the elastic net and iTwinner. iTwinner is the method that we propose, where we try to identify genes with different correlation patterns between these two groups. And finally, we apply the first classifiers to this smaller uh, data set containing genes identified by these two regularizers. And regarding the results, we saw that the, approach, the third approach, where we use genes preselected by regularization, had the best results, and iTwinner, followed by Random Forest, was the one that showed the best accuracy. So the method that we propose, iTwinner, is a promising strategy for the the, for the classification of CRC patients based on RNA-seq data and for the disclosure of biomarkers of CRC metastasis. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now asking Rui Oliveira Silva. Thank you, you're ready. From uh, IST, and I ask João Sequeira to be ready for the next presentation. Hello, welcome to my PhD about nanoparticle-based biosensors. So if you ask yourself, what is information, probably you realize that not a simple definition comes to mind. However, it's undeniable that information is important. From our genomes to history books to the world around us, we have information uh, that can exist in many forms and obtained in many ways. So for example, naturally, we have our own inbuilt sensors that allow you to see me, to hear me, while I'm standing in here. So fast forwarding this to our battle against diseases, we can perceive biosensors as our white hat spies 
that render us information about the given system, and then we can adapt our response accordingly to what is happening. So during my thesis, I uh, developed sensors envisioning the following situation. A patient arrives at the hospital, so he needs a diagnostic. So, so I developed a, a fluorescence enhancement diagnostic method that detects nucleic acids. After diagnostics, the patient needs a treatment. So I developed magnetic nanothermometers that allows you to follow, to track the process during hyperthermia treatments, for example. After treatment, you need a follow-up to, to understand what is happening with the patient. So to manage this, uh, I developed a metabolic, metabolic sensor that allows you to measure proteolytic activity in real time while uh, giving information about its kinetics. So by the end of the day, I hope we manage to uh, mitigate the poor outcomes that the patient suffers and uh, the patient can go home, live happily ever after. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I'm now calling João Sequeira from the Faculty of Sciences and invite João Cotovio to be ready for next presentation. Okay, so good morning everyone. My name is João Sequeira and today I'll be presenting you what was my master thesis entitled High Throughput Virtual Screening to Identify Non-Covalent Inhibitors of CRM1 with Antitumoral Potential. So CRM1 is a protein that mediates nucleocytoplasmic transport of micromolecules and that is often overexpressed in tumor cells. The cargo binding to this protein happens in the outer surface on what is known as the NES binding groove. The inhibition of this protein, this is, okay. The inhibition of this protein happens by preventing cargo from binding and actually all known inhibitors to date establish, establish a covalent bond with a cysteine present in this pocket. So, the only inhibitor that is actually found to have the capacity of binding non-covalently to CIM1 is NCI1. So, the objective of my thesis was to discover non-covalent inhibitors of CIM1. And to do this, we used MD simulations to try and sample a more representative confirmation of the pocket, which were then used in a high-throughput virtual screening protocol using a compound database provided by our collaborator, Professor Silvestri. These are a few examples of the confirmations that we obtained in this docking protocol, and we looked at them and we analyzed them alongside their binding energies to select 30 compounds to be experimentally tested by another collaborator of our group, Professor Wolfgang Link. However, from these inhibition assays, no non-covalent inhibitors were found, but they were positively used as leads to identify other promising compounds that have just been published five days ago. So, in order to obtain a computational pipeline that can positively identify non-covalent inhibitors of CRM1, we'll be now using NCI1 in a reverse docking protocol using all of the structures from these simulations, and this will hopefully lead to us identifying representative confirmations of the NES binding groove, which will be used in a new high-throughput virtual screening protocol, to including all of the newly found promising compounds. With this, I finish my presentation, and thank you very much. We'll now have uh, João Cotovio from IST, and I'm inviting José Maria Moreira also to be ready. For... I want to start with the icons of the previous three industrial revolutions, the steam engine, the automobile, and the personal computer. They all share a common property. They are all assemblies out of parts. Since the first industrial revolution, the world of engineering has been dominated by this culture of parts. But if you look at the natural world, you can see that living things are made not of assemblies, but an organic continuum that continuously change their properties. My name is João Cotovio and I'm here to present you my PhD project. So I want you to know that about 2 million of people die per year of liver disease and that hepatotoxicity is the number one cause of drug withdrawals. And I think that liver organoids could be the solution. So the idea is to create mini livers that recreate the physiology and architecture of the human liver, helping us to understand liver disease, but also to test new drugs. Several scientists already tried to create these liver organoids, but they all failed to recreate liver complexity and embryonic development. So in my PhD, and why? Because they are all assemblies. They, they all try to mix the different cell types that constitute the human liver. 
But in my PhD, we developed an innovative system where from a single aggregate, we can recreate for the first time ever the complexity and the developmental process of the human liver that until now was only known from animal models. So with our technology, we have the power to change liver therapeutics towards precision medicine. And you can think of my organoids in previous strategies as a duality between assembly and growth. One is imposing the environment, the other creates it. One is designed for nature, the other is designed by her. Thank you. Thank you. We now have José María Moreira from IST, and I invite the last presenter, Eunice Paisana from the Medical School. Hello, everyone. My name is José María Moreira, and I'm here to present uh, a project part of my PhD. And this work was made on uh, MR images of patients with multiple myeloma, which is a disease that is characterized by the abnormal proliferation of uh, malignant plasma cells in the bone marrow, leading to bone lesions, anemia, and other clinical complications. So we know that apparent diffusion coefficient maps and T1 weighted images are used for diagnosis of multiple myeloma, where the segmentation of vertebral bodies is of the utmost importance. And this segmentation can be tedious, laborious, and time-consuming, so it's clear the need for an automatic tool to facilitate this task. So we present a deep learning methodology for segmentation using the VNet, which is a state-of-the-art deep convolutional neural network for segmentation. And we trained our model with 89 T1 weighted images and 65 ADC maps, validating our findings with uh, with 56 T1 weighted images and 59 ADC maps, uh, resulting in the performance of the model for the T1 weighted images of 89.3% and for the ADC of 77.5. We can see here an example of the segmentation performed by the models and uh, uh, in contrast for the segmentation performed by a trained radiologist. So, in the end, we, we want to use this segmentation, automatic segmentation, to create new predictive models of survival or staging for multiple myeloma patients. Thank you so much. Thank you. Last presentation from Eunice Paisana from the medical school. So I will only give you the title of my presentation at the end. Uh, to start with, uh, I worked with brain metastasis during my PhD, and brain metastases are the most uh, common brain tumor in adults, and around 40% of all cancer patients will eventually develop this malignancy. Currently, the standard of care is surgery and radiation therapy, and the survival is, up to, is around 6 to 10 months. For this work, we hypothesize that brain metastases from different primary origins share common genetic events that uh, promote dissemination to the brain and can be therapeutically targeted. We started our work uh, by sequencing uh, samples from Hospital Santa Maria uh, from different primary origins, and uh, we evaluated differentially expressed genes in these samples, and we found that UBTC was highly expressed in brain metastases. We validated this finding in an independent cohort of patients by immunistic chemistry, and we found that the survival of patients is uh, significantly, significantly decreased in patients with high expression of UB to C. We further validated this uh, target uh, by performing in vitro and in vivo assays, and I'm showing you here the, our intracranial model uh, of um, uh, models with uh, overexpression, uh, overexpression of UB to C, and we see that not only these animals have a decreased survival, but also have an increase in leptomeningeal dissemination, which is a, um, a phenotype of aggressive disease in brain metastasis patients. Um, we wanted, as I told you in the beginning, to find uh, a target that could be therapeutically inhibited, and we found that ductalizib, a pietric AMTOR inhibitor, could potentially uh, inhibit the UBTC action. And what we found is that the leptomeningeal dissemination found uh, by the UBTC uh, promotion uh, can be prevented uh, or abrogated in these animals. So I hope I convinced you that UBTC promotes left angel dissemination in uh, brain metastasis and can be therapeutically targeted uh, by ductalizib. Thank you. So thank you very much. I think we have seen a very great, a great overview of uh, research work and innovative work done by our students from different schools. Uh,
Well, uh, I'm now closing the session. Our chairs are there discussing. They are responsible also for leading with awards. So thank you very much. Let's go for lunch and we'll have still a lot of discussion along the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.